did when did the Ernest Jones talks begin? Can you talk about that, that deal a little bit and what he might bring to the to the team? Yeah, Ernest is a good, you know, young, talented um, linebacker in this league, has been, you know, since he came in. And, um, you know, we started conversations probably over the weekend. Um, I've had a long standing relationship, you know, with Les Snead, worked together for nine years, him and Tony Pastors. Um, and so just started as the typical phone calls that we get this time of year. Hey, you guys looking for anybody? You guys shopping anybody? And uh, the conversation started from there, and we looked into it and, you know, did our research and watched the film. You know, a bunch of us in a room, our coaches watched him um, and thought that he was a young player that could help us. Concern you when they're so out on him and the price tag is so reasonable? Well, no, I'm not because, uh, you know, I have my intel. Um, I worked in that building for five, six years, worked with Les for nine years, and so I feel comfortable with the information I got out of there um, and the player that we were bringing in. He talked a little bit about the knee just now, but from your understanding, what was the, the situation with it? Well, not to violate HIPAA laws and talk about you know his fully uh, his medical, um, but again, um, their head trainer uh, Reggie Scott uh, was trained under Todd Torricelli um, when he first came into the league. Their director of rehab, uh, Byron Cunningham, was one of my closest friends. Um, so, in terms of getting the medical, understanding where the knee was, we were fully comfortable and, and knowledgeable of what it was, and you know, and, and what we need to uh, do for him to keep him going. In trading Malik. In, in terms of making that move, was that just a product of that there wasn't going to be room for three guys on the 53-man roster or that you weren't going to be able to slip him through waivers and get him to the practice? No, I don't think it's either of those. I think uh, Malik earned the opportunity to have a chance to be the backup, you know, whether it was here or somewhere else. And, you know, he, he fought his ass off while he was here and done everything that we asked him to do. And I think everybody in this room and beyond this room saw the improvement you know, that he made, which is a testament to the young man, but also, you know, to our coaching staff and Bo Hart agree in the work that he put in with him. Um, but when it came down to it, um, Mason had a, you know, a, a better uh, off season and a better preseason um, and helped move our offense down the field. And, you know, when it uh, ultimately came down to it, you know, we talk about, you know, taking care of people, you know, and doing what's right for our guys. And, you know, when Green Bay called, um, and we knew that Malik had an opportunity to be the backup, which we feel he deserved. It wasn't necessarily about the compensation. It was just doing right by Malik and giving him that opportunity. What went into the decision to waive the net and Weaver? Um, procedurally, um, you know, and I think it'll be coming out here soon. We claim two guys um, at the cut down, and um, obviously you, you get an hour to <laughs> to make those moves. Um, you know, we, we'd like to get both of those guys back, but it was a procedural thing for us to be in compliance with the 53-man okay. roster. Is, is Ali Gay, uh, for, for both of you, Brian, if you could chime in, mm -hmm. is he a, a defensive lineman for you or an edge? Um, he, he will be an edge, but he's a guy that's versatile. He can put his hand in the dirt. He can stand up. He's long. He's athletic. He's rangy. Um, and he can, you know, do both of those things, in my opinion. Coach, you want to? Yeah, he, just, he can play both spots. I mean, he can rush on the edge. And outside linebackers and sub are just defensive ends. So it's it's the same position. And you're just standing up on the ball in base defense. So, um, yeah, he fits he fits a, a prototype of what we're looking for for that spot. Hey Brian, I ran. Were there certain guys that you wanted to maybe surprise with news that they'd made the team? And if so, what were those? What was that like informing those players? I guess you guys will have to see. Um, Dun, dun, yeah. Dun, dun. yeah, no. It, those were those were the uh, we did those at the end of the day. We picked a few guys to tell that um, that they had made the fifty three, and that helps bring you out of the the fog of and the the downness of telling all those other guys they didn't. So um, it was a good pick me up at the end of the day. It was a long day, um, but it was fun to see those guys' reactions to uh, knowing that they had, they had fulfilled the dream of theirs and making an NFL football team. We just had so much turnover into the running backs, picking uh, you know Julius over Hassan. Yeah, Julius performed just performed better than Hassan over the course of the preseason and in practice. It, um, Hassan Hassan did a good job, but Julius was just better um, at every opportunity that he had, and so. Uh, Hassan still did a nice job on special teams, but um, ultimately probably wasn't enough for him to, to take that third spot from Julius, and, and Julius earned it. Um, and he was really productive over the course of the preseason, and, and he's been really good uh, in the practice sessions as well. So I uh, feel really good about Julius as our third back, and um, obviously Hassan has, has found work elsewhere, uh, which we knew he would, um, but that's how it shook out. What's your comfort level with sticking with four corners? Do you feel like you need a fifth or a sixth, or is this four kind of where you're 
I think you're always looking for, for the next, you know, whatever the fifth guy might be in that room. But we've also got guys in the practice squad you can elevate. That's an easy – that's an easy – they each get two elevations apiece. And usually that fifth corner is your special teams player anyway. Um, and so those are – those are roster mechanics that, that we work through. But as of right now, uh, with the practice squad guys and the guys in the roster, feel pretty good where that spot's at. And we can always add more uh, if one were to be available. How about defensive line depth? Yeah, same same thing. I mean, there's we still got a couple guys in the practice squad um, that can fit that role. Um, you're still only going to carry probably, probably five on game day anyway. Um, so... You know, it's it is what it is. I mean, obviously losing Marlon, we would like to have Marlon. That would have helped um, as for depth purposes and rotational purposes. But uh, we feel pretty good about where we're at. And again, always looking to continue to add guys, especially up front. Yeah, and this is just and this is this is just the first iteration of the fifty three. It's not going to be final and concrete and set. I don't think there's probably ever been any team that was set today that made it all the way through January. You know, anyway, but this is just the first iteration. Uh, we still got another waiver wire to come out here in a little bit of guys coming available, and we wanted to maintain a fluid, you know, position where we can make moves and not have to continue to make tough choices and get rid of people. We wanted to have the flexibility to continue to bring people in. Right now, as you look at the punt return situation, you got Jake Juan, but how do things look after him? Uh, you only need one for the punt return. Um, you always want to have a reserve, right? Sure. At the, we got guys that can catch the ball. Tyler Boyd's returned punts before. Um, you know, obviously you could elevate Mason Kinsey if you had to. He's returned punts. So um, those aren't – we got one, which is where you need to start. Um, and then after that, if you needed another one, you'd have to figure it out. But um, we got guys in the roster that have done it and guys in the practice squad that have done it. So feel pretty comfortable. What factored, into the, what factored into the decision to move on from Elijah Molden? I mean, that's to be announced. You know, I know what the reports are out there, um, and we'll talk about that at another time. With the tackle depth, you guys, with um, keeping Jalen Duncan and John Ajuku, uh, do you think just the development you could see out of these guys with a guy like Bill as the coach is, is part of the process, too, of, of keeping guys like that? Yeah, I would say so. Um, you know, JD's done a good job. Um, he's continued to develop. Uh, I mean, he started a ton of games for us last year at left tackle, which gave him great experience. He's also finished a couple games for us at right, you know, and so he's getting that experience over there. And I think OJ, I, you know, I joked with him yesterday. I think he was the first person um, to ever – teach my daughter what reporting eligible meant you know I've never seen somebody take so much pride in reporting eligible when that was his role you know last year but he's another guy that came on and earned it you know what I mean and so um and then let's let's be frank let's be honest this time of year nobody's letting go of you know good quality tackles um but we've invested in these guys so it's you know we have to see this investment through and allow these guys to get the experience how would you like about those two the waiver pickups I guess have come in with the, the guys you added today yeah I think um uh, think the guys that we that we're adding um you know, starting with um, Ali, he's, he's a long, rangy guy. Uh, you've seen him develop over the years. Um, and, you know, he brings us that versatility, a guy that can stand up, put his hand in the dirt, you know, a line, uh, a line across the front, you know, whether it's in sub or in base. Um, and then with Julius, is you know, he's a tough, hard-nosed kid. Um, got a text from uh, Bones Fossil. You know, he basically was like, damn you. You know, that's a good pickup, you know, one of his core guys. And there's not a – Special teams coach in this league that I respect more than Bones, you know, and, and how he sees special teams guys. So, and he was a guy that our scouts, you know, put a lot of work into and, you know, identified him and, you know, were excited to get. So it's. Hoda Coy, another one of those guys that earned it, and what was it like to maybe reward him with the news that he, he made it? Again, you guys, you guys, you guys will get to see that. And I'm, I'm excited about you uh, getting to see it. But, you know, a guy like, um, you know, a guy like Thomas O. Um, you know, he's never not here um, in the building. You know, this off season he was here just as much as people who worked in the building, you know, and just the, the way he works and just kind of, kind of how he goes about his business. But for a guy to be an international practice squad guy, you know, to now earn his chance on a 53, that's what this league is about. That's what that program was about, you know, being able to have international guys that you work with for a couple of years and develop them and for them to have this opportunity. Brian Sneed indicated he was full today. What's the plan for him from now through next week and going into Chicago? Uh, he's practicing, so he's he's ready to roll. Um, he should be um, a full participant with no limitations um, at every practice from now until we play. Um, so that's that's part of part of the plan was to get him to this point. Uh, that's why you didn't see him a ton in training camp, and he got most of his work uh, in the walkthrough sessions and jog through sessions that you guys weren't at. 
Um, but yeah, he's he should be uh, ready to roll. Same, same. He's uh, he was not a full participant today, but he should be full by next week. Brian, you talked about how difficult the decision making process would be. How do you feel like you navigated all of that as the head coach to arrive at, I guess, your first version of the fifty three? Yeah, it was. Uh, thankfully, I have a lot of help. You know, um, that's that's the cool part is Rand and and his staff and our coaching staff and and the people that um, evaluate these players and pour into these players and you know you have opinions about what it what what we need and where we need to go and uh, that part was really really smooth. I think um, everything about how we went through our process from the time that I've gotten here until now has been collaborative and it was no different. Um, in this process. And so Rand and I delivered the news together to all the players, um, which I thought was the right thing to do. And that was worked out really well, uh, both positive and negative news. And um, yeah, I just, it's, it hasn't felt, didn't feel any different than anything else has felt um, since I've gotten here. So um, that part I think is really positive and, and I enjoy that part because we got a lot of people that are good at their jobs and we let it do, we let them do it. Rand, last year you, you talked about leaning on the previous head coach, and now this year, the new head coach is leaning on you. How has that process been? Uh, what's that been like? I'm, I'm the young OG uh, in, in the room. Uh, no, like you said, it was collaborative. Uh, we had a ton of conversations, even down to as the waiver wire came out last night. Uh, we spent the week uh, leading up to the New Orleans game. Um, you know, the staff just locked in the room for eight hours, just grinding tape, you know, until you really couldn't watch anymore. So we felt good about the preparation put in, you know, to that point. And so when the waiver wire came back, we went another spin on the tape to make sure we were good. And, you know, just having a constant communication with the coaches, if we liked the guy, hey, make sure you guys watch, you know, and our staff, you know, um, you know, led by Anthony Robinson and uh, A.J. Highsmith, they did a really good job of communicating with the coaches, making the coaches' job easier, you know, creating point of attack tapes of the players that we were considering, you know, to make their job easier to evaluate these guys. And, you know, whether it was uh, Nick Holtz or, you know, Colt Anderson or Denard, you know, we were in constant communication with them watching guys and getting their feedback as we were trying to make these decisions. I think the roster uh – as developed over the last year, the decisions were tougher this year compared to, to last year as far as some of the last spots. Oh, yeah. I mean, even even to the you know last couple of decisions we've had to make before we went to practice today, you know, we were, you know, in, in full transparency, we were up until, what, about five or ten minutes left, you know, before we had to submit, you know, our um, – you know the guys that we were flipping out, you know, for the uh, for the roster claims, and so uh, it was tough decisions, you know, all the way around, and and not just tough decisions, you know, because of numbers um, or whatnot, but we've developed relationships with these guys, you know, over uh, myself over the last two seasons, and you know Brian since he's been here um, in January, so you develop relationships with these guys, you genuinely care about these guys, and you know you we're we're the ones that deliver the news, so um, yet yeah, to answer the question, yes, it was tough decisions, but. You know, when it all came down to it, uh, every guy that we spoke to understood what we were trying to do. Uh, whether we chose to bring them back on the practice squad or not, they understood the vision and they were appreciative of their opportunity. Did you get any claims for anybody that, uh, at the tight end position? One more time. When you guys made up the tight end room and then you know, released Nick, any any concerns about experience there, or do you feel like like the talent that you have kind of? No, we'll we'll be getting we'll be getting Nick back. Um, Nick Vanette will be back with us. So, um, again, like we said earlier, that was more of a procedural, you know, move to be in compliance with the 53, but uh, we will we will be signing Nick Vanette back. To be back on the 53? Yes. Yep. So then you'll have to make a procedural move cutting somebody up? Will not. You're at 52 right now. We, we will be able to sign Nick Vanette back to the 53 without making any procedural moves. Would there be any consideration of putting Cedric Gray on IR to start the season, or is that something you see him working through in the next couple of weeks? Well, I get to break news. Um, <laughs> uh, according to sources, uh, we will be placing uh, Cedric Gray on IR, uh, designated for return, um, just to give him an opportunity to, you know, get healthy. Um, had the conversation with Cedric um, this morning. Um, you know, he's 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 one of those guys that you got to protect him from himself. You know, because he wants to prove that you know he he wants to be on his team and he's earned the right to be on his team, and so. With the nature of his injury, we just got to protect him from himself and give him, you know, an even longer period to to get back healthy for us. Ran all the injuries at that position. How much did that play into the decision to trade for Ernest? No, I mean it, it's it's you talk about sometimes just being lucky, 
and things falling in your lap, and that was just one of those situations. I think, you know, if you go back to the very beginning, we were excited about Wallow you know, and where he was going. And then, you know, he gets hurt. And obviously everyone's seen, you know, how chance has developed. And, you know, then his injury happens. And so it's it's just one of those things that just fell in your lap, the opportunity to add a guy that's played a ton of ball, that's played at a Pro Bowl, you know, level, uh, that's played in a lot of big games. And it was an opportunity for us to add him. And so we, we took that chance. When you Should add you an me? established veteran like that to a room, <laughs> do, you, uh, do you feel the need to have a conversation with the guys that it might impact – playing time or role within the team and, and I guess what do those conversations look like for either one of you? Yeah, that was the first thing we did, you know, before, you know, we, we agreed to terms uh, with the Rams and our next phone call was to uh, to Gibby, you know, and just let him know like, hey, continue to do what you do. Um, you know, for for Ernest, Ernest has to come in and earn the spot. He hadn't been here, you know, so it's, it's up for those two to figure it out. Um, but we're going to always be um, – you know, communicative with these guys and let them know um, from the very start, even when we signed, you know, Quandre Diggs, you know, that was a conversation with, with Hook. That was a conversation with Elijah, you know, about, you know, what was coming. And so uh, we never want these guys to be blindsided or surprised by anything. And if they have any thoughts, con uh, concerns, comments, critiques, you know, they can always come to me and Callie and we'll be transparent with them. Did you put in any claims for anybody that was, was also claimed by a team higher in the pecking order? No. For both of you, please. Uh, Chad said it way back at the owners' meetings that uh, when we were talking about the definition of success this year, that, that it was broadly based on how fast so much change gelled. And you've had probably more change since then than, than any of you expected in terms of veteran additions. How much do you think that, that is the key to this year and how many different directions c can that go? Yeah, anytime you're adding new players, <clears throat> new faces, new people, um, you're looking at at change and you're looking at get relationships that you have to build and um, I feel really good about the ones we've built so far and then we'll, we'll add in the guys that we've added in um, and keep pushing forward you know that's that's sort of the name of the game and I think we got the right people which I think is what makes the biggest difference is we got really good really good people um, on the roster on our coaching staff on our team and people that um, I think are really um, good at building relationships and so yeah, it's always a part of it. I, I'm, I'm not going to gloss over it and say that, you know, everyone just comes in and on the same page at every second, every moment. It takes work. And um, the guys that have been here have worked at it and will continue to work with the guys that we add. So um, it's it'll always be in progress, I think, as every year you add more players and new players come in and old players leave. And that's just sort of the nature of the NFL. And so that's why every year, I think, is a new team. And whether you – uh, even when you have returning players coming back each year, your your team is different. Um, there's different pieces, different people around the team, and and you have to keep finding out what your team is for that season. And um, that's what our job is, and uh, that process is ongoing. And to add to that, I would say you know it's a testament to the leaders that we have on this team. You know, guys like Jeff, you know, who is, you know. Obviously, he's always been a leader here, um, but to see where he's grown as a leader and doing things to get in the defensive unit together and those guys spending time together, um, you see that a lot and you kind of see that within the relationships as guys flow throughout the building and the same thing with Will, you know, with the offense and those guys spending a lot of time together. So, um, like Brian said, we have a lot of people here who uh, value relationships, um, not just you know, from our side of the building, but in the locker room. And all those guys have continued to work within each other. And, you know, I had a conversation with Jeff last week, you know, and he was just telling me that, you know, he feels really strongly about the locker room and, the, you know, the, and how the guys are amongst each other. And, I mean, they are they are a, a cool group to be around. I mean, you know, Calvin, you see this out at practice every day, you know, after practice, you know, you see Calvin and, uh, and T. Boyd, you know, out running sprints together. Those guys never played together before, but they've created that relationship that bond you know within each other as well as other position groups you see you know Tajay and Tony how they're joined at the hip you know at every turn and so that's you know that's pretty consistent across our roster. What will success be defined as this year is it winning record I mean that's that's the bottom line in this league or is there something else that, uh, that, that has to happen? Well, you're looking to build a foundation too you know something that's that is going to be uh, enduring, sustainable um, for the foreseeable future on top of that. So um, there's a lot of work in, in building the, the culture of the building uh, between the coaches and players, our coaches and our front office staff, our, our coaching staff, our front office staff, and the rest of the building. So um, that's, that's part of an ongoing process for us. And I think that um, what I'm looking for is to continue that 
building a foundation. And then you hope that that's what propels you. I mean, we have talented players. We have talented coaches. Um, I feel good about our team's ability to be competitive uh, in these games that we have to play. Um, and we'll see how it shakes out. Is everyone that was in the concussion protocol uh, out now or anybody still still in there? Uh, no, everybody's everybody practiced today. So uh, the only only guys that didn't practice um, was D Hop and oh, there might have been one or two others, but Jamal didn't practice and but and that was it. Everybody else was at practice. So we're Jamal, just... Jamal, right now just normal veteran stuff that we're managing. So um, nothing at this point that. I need to comment on, but we'll see next week too. In looking for a practice squad quarterback, you want somebody that's already familiar with systems similar to yours, or you want a young guy to try to develop? No, I think in a perfect world, you find in a, a younger, a younger player, a guy in his first or second year that you can you can develop and pour into and, and see if you can, um, you know, build your own in a sense. Um, but that doesn't put us in a box. We're going to try to find the best quarterback that we can find out there and. If there's not one immediately, we're not going to just sign one to sign one either. Um, so, I think they're just we're, we'll we'll be patient and we'll find the right fit for us. But yeah, I, I would I would enjoy having a, a another young quarterback in there um, to develop and work with. Um, but but we'll see. Is Brian made a different feel maybe now that you're down to 53 and you got a game coming up in 10 11 days, or is that next week when you start getting into game week mode? Say the first part. Of that, is, is there a different feel maybe around the team maybe at practice or? in the building you think now as you as you have eyes towards Chicago. Yeah, I think you start to feel this I think these guys are looking forward to a, their break. Um to be honest, I think they they need we're trying to get them back this week. Practices obviously aren't as intense. Um you know, I went inside today cuz it was so hot, so I didn't you know, I didn't want to put them out there in the sun and dehydrate guys and all that. So, um you know, we got we have our eye towards the opener and I think that's where we're at now, but these guys will take a couple of days this weekend and refresh and and come back and usually it's it's Monday when you really feel it and it's there's a whole new energy and intensity to the building and to the players cuz they know what's coming. It's it's time to go. It's there is no more uh, training camp. There's no more OTAs. It's it's football time, and so uh, you feel that from the team, but you don't feel it quite yet. They're they're measured in their approach. It's keeping five oh, more. tight ends with Vanette coming back. Is that an intentional roster design element of the way that you're wanting to run your offense, or is that just a nature of like you were talking about last week, where we wanted to get the best football players regardless of position? Yeah, it's more the it's more the latter. If you're gonna if you're trying to put them in a bucket, um, because I think that. We felt like be between DMR and Thomas that we had two two guys that fit two different positions in the tight end room, um, both equally well. And it's hard to find tight ends. Um, it's they're not the good ones are are generally difficult to find. And um, we've gotten two guys that one Thomas has been you know poured into over three years now, and so you would you'd hate to put Thomas on waivers and and now he's somebody else's gain for all the work you put into into the player um and then d m r was you know again young athletic talented that those guys usually usually don't make it through waivers, not to say they they would or would not have we'll never know um but that was by design as we wanted to keep our young players that we think at a position that it's hard to develop and it takes time to develop at. Um, to make sure we had young guys in the room that we felt really good about. You guys went young at the tight end position at the bottom and the offensive line position, going with guys instead of some older guys that people thought had a chance to make the roster. Is that an element of wanting to get guys with more upside? Does, does where you're at in a team-building standpoint play into that kind of decision? Um, I, yeah, I think everything, everything plays into those decisions. Those are never singular decisions. Um, there's always elements of all those things that – that get discussed, um, but I think for the offensive line guys, those are the guys that perform the best um, in the preseason games and in the practice. I mean, those guys, uh, JD performed really well, and he's sort of steadily risen over the entire process uh, of training camp. and And Jo had a had some up and down moments, but really has finished on a really high note. I thought he played really well in the game, um, and his practices the last week and a half have been. Uh, on the rise. And so those guys earn that. Um, obviously we brought Leroy back on the practice squad. So um, we have another tackle there that's available to us, but um, those are, those guys earned it, I think is the best way to put it. And they played the best. And so um, we don't really care as much about years of service or anything like that. That our best players are going to make our roster. Denard, Denard had mentioned uh, he called 
Quandre Diggs and Jamal Adams, the, the pit bull and iron fist. I, I know, you know, you've talked in the past about leadership. Those guys with those nicknames, like how have they come in and, and, and set the tone and, and serve that leadership that you were looking for? I would say initially, you know, because both of those guys have been been captains where they came from. And so now you come into a building, into a room where, you know, Hook has been the elder statesman, you know, there. So I think they came in cognizant of, you know, Hook's tenure here and just kind of saw where they fit in. But, you know, when you got personalities like Quandre, you know, and like Jamal, people just naturally gravitate to him. Um, and and everyone in that room is just playing off of each other. You know, the, uh, Jamal is probably a little more boisterous or probably the most boisterous one, you know, in that room. Uh, whereas, <laughs> whereas, you know, Hook and Quandre, Quandre is one of those, you know, um, I'll speak when spoken to type people, but when he speaks, people listen, you know. And so, and Hook is kind of the, the leader by example you know, in that room. So we got a good mixture of leadership, and I think all those guys play off each other. How intentional was it to kind of package those guys together and bring them in? Say that one more time. I said, how intentional was it to package those guys together and bring them in, you know, the way that you, you did? Yeah, I mean, it was it was the thought process of, you know, spending time with Denard and understanding what he wanted to do. I mean, you look at what they did in, in Baltimore last year. They consistently, I'd probably say 60% of the snaps played with three safeties on the field. You know, and um, and so to, to give him that same option here to be able to have versatile chess pieces for him to create his packages with, you know, we thought that was that would be good for us and allow us to put the best 11 on the field. Ren, you're in a nice cap situation. Might that tempt you to, to make one more big move if something nice presents itself or uh, will you lean towards fiscal responsibility to help you next year and, and keep you in good – standing no I mean we're going to always be fiscally responsible I think uh, if you look at last year uh, this time of year and probably throughout most of the part of the year we were in the top five in cap space um, throughout the year and I mean you, you have to uh, leave yourself some operating costs you know just for injuries you know signing guys if you have to place guys on IR so we're going to be responsible there if opportunity presents itself um, that's too good for us to pass up you know we're definitely going to look at it um, definitely not opposed to doing that and making this team better um, but just to go out and just spend money to spend it we're never going to do that